This video is sponsored by Squarespace. What's going on people? Today we're explaining how the timeline of Attack on Titan would have completely changed if Armin inherited the Armored Titan. As we know, back in Season 3 there was a time when the scouts had captured both Reiner and Bertolt, but thanks to Reiner's indestructible plot armor, he was the one that was saved while his friend was left behind. In this video, we're exploring how things would have played out if the situation was reversed, with Reiner being the one who was eaten and Bertolt being the one who was saved by Peak. Before we get into it though, this video is the first half of a two-part series, so don't forget to colossal smash that sub button so you don't miss the final part when it comes out. Okay, so the new timeline begins in the year 850, with the warriors arriving back home having just been beaten by the scouts. In the original series, this was the time period when the Middle Eastern Alliance declared war against Mali, since they figured the warriors were vulnerable having just lost their female and colossal titans. However, in this alternate timeline where Bertolt survived, they never would have declared war in the first place, and the reason for this is pretty simple. In the world of Attack on Titan, Bertolt is the closest thing to a nuclear weapon that exists, and despite all the anti-Titan tech, enemy nations still don't have anything that could deal with him. As a very quick example of what I mean, let's imagine for a second that Bertolt was there during the battle at Force Lava. In the anime, we saw how the Beast and Armor Titan struggled to get the job done and were nearly killed, whereas Bertolt by himself could have single-handedly blown up the Middle Eastern fleet while also crushing Fort Slava with his colossal foot. To put it simply, the difference in power between him and the other warriors is so massive that no country would be dumb enough to declare war against Mali while he's still alive. As a result, in this new timeline, the Middle Eastern war never happened, which drastically changes how the military reacts to losing two of their Titan shifters. For a start, I think it's highly likely that Bertolt would argue they need to return to the island, since he'd want to save Annie and Reiner as quickly as possible. Remember, Marley didn't know that Paradis had the fluid to turn Armin into a Titan, so as far as they're aware, Reiner and Annie could genuinely both still be alive. That's why Bertolt would be desperate to move quickly before something happens, but I reckon Commander Magath would be 50-50 about the whole thing. On one hand, he'd agree that they should try to get their missing warriors back, but on the flip side, there's a risk that trying to do this could result in even more people being killed. If Mali continues to lose more and more shifters, then it's only a matter of time until they lose their dominant position in the world, so he'd be hesitant for any of them to go back. However, this is the moment where Zeke would chip in, as he'd remind the commander that right now the island is more exposed than any time in the past five years. While it is true that Paradis technically won the battle in Shiganshina, they lost virtually the entire survey corps in the process, which everyone knows are their strongest fighters. With only a handful of scouts remaining, there's no way they'd be able to hold back the warriors a second time, especially if Mali attacks sooner rather than later. Zeke would also try to scare everyone by claiming that they need to capture the founder before he gains a better understanding of his abilities, otherwise they might get trampled by the rumbling. Of course, that part would be a bluff since Zeke knows that Eren can't use the founder without a titan of royal blood, but obviously no one in Mali is aware of that besides him. After hearing all this, it's virtually guaranteed that Magath would reluctantly agree to return to Paradis, but first, he'd want to gather some intel before launching a full-scale invasion. To be specific, what they need to know is Eren's location, Annie and Ryan's location, and how the Malian army can avoid the threat of pure titans. The answer to those questions will determine what their strategy is going to be, and to acquire this intel, they need to send a small team to infiltrate the island. For their own personal reasons, Zeke and Bertolt would definitely volunteer themselves to join this mission, but Magath would order Bertolt to stay behind, partly because Molly needs the Colossal as a deterrent, but also because it's hard for Bertolt to go undercover when literally everyone knows his face. In the end, the warriors chosen to infiltrate Paradise would be Zeke and Peak, and their instructions would be to learn what they can and return to the harbour within three weeks regardless of what happens. If neither of them makes it back within this time period, then the general will assume they've been captured by the scouts, meaning the warriors have a solid deadline to return by, unlike the original mission five years ago. A few nights later, Zeke and Peak would then be brought to the island by ship, disguised in clothes that more easily allow them to blend in with society. Thanks to this disguise, they're easily able to sneak into Trost District without any problems, but it wouldn't take them long to realize that something's wrong. All across the city, the mood would be completely unusual, and that's because in the short time since the warriors were last here, everyone has learned the truth about the outside world. The findings from Grisha's books were published in newspapers and bulletins all across the country, and people would still be coming to terms with the idea that there are humans outside the walls trying to invade them. In Pete's case, I imagine that she'd be concerned about this development, because if the island suspects that Marley is planning to invade them soon, then the military police might be on the lookout for undercover spies. Given that they don't have ID, it's possible they could be questioned, but Zeke would just brush it off and tell her not to worry about it. In his own mind, it's actually a good thing that Eren now has a concept of humanity outside the walls, since this will make it easier to convince his brother of the need for the euthanization plan. Before we get into that though, over the next three weeks, the Malian army would continue to make preparations for a full-scale invasion, with Bertolt being an advisor due to his extensive knowledge of the island's capabilities. 
At the same time, Zeke and Peek would be completing their mission and travelling deeper into the walls, and after finally tracking down Eren, they'd watch on from a distance as he shows Armin how to fight with the Armored Titan. For the two warriors, this would be confirmation that Paradis is somehow producing Titan Transformation Serum, and with Reiner being dead, they'd spend their last few days on the island searching for any sign of Annie. Gradually, the search would bring them to Stoess, where they overhear a rumour from some civilians that she's being held at Military Police HQ. With that bit of info, Peek would now be more than ready to return back home, but Zeke would argue that he should stay behind to watch over the female titan. His argument would be that they have no idea why Annie is still alive even though Ryan has been eaten, and his theory is that Paradis must be in the process of selecting female titan candidates. If the warriors leave now, then there's a small chance Annie might be eaten by the time they get back, so he'd volunteer to stay in Stoas for two additional days. This would give Peek time to get back to Marley and report everything they've discovered, and in a couple days when the military arrives, Zeke agrees to meet them at the harbour with the latest info about Annie's condition. Despite not fully trusting the words coming out of his mouth, at the end of the day, Zeke is still the war chief, which means that other warriors generally follow what he says unless they have a passionate reason not to. That's why Peek would make her way back to Marley overnight, and the following day she'd explain the intel to Magath, Porco, and the rest of the team. In particular, Bertolt would be almost inconsolable after hearing about Reiner's death, especially because Armin is the person who ate him. In Bertolt's head, it was his failure to kill Armin that directly led to his best friend being eaten, but interestingly, I think this guilt would make him more determined to at least rescue Annie. Moving on, with Peek's intel, the military would finalise their plan to capture the Founding Titan, and the next day they'd arrive at the harbour where Zeke is supposed to be. However, as the morning drags on, there'd be no sign of the Beast Titan anywhere, gradually causing the warriors to wonder if something happened to the War Chief. What they wouldn't know is that everything is coming together exactly the way Zeke intended, but to explain how, we first need to look back at the original timeline. In the main timeline, it was pretty clear that Zeke had a lot of things he wanted to say to Eren, but due to the Middle Eastern War, the only way he could communicate was through messengers like Yelena and the Azimabito. In this alternate reality though, the scenario was flipped around, with Zeke having this chance to be on the island by himself and personally talk to his brother. Of course, the problem here is that Eren perceives him as the enemy for obvious reasons, so the challenge for Zeke is getting Eren to trust him in a short space of time. To accomplish this, what he needs to do is number one, prove that he's not a threat, and number two, create a situation where the scouts have no choice but to rely on him. The first part of this plan began the night Peek arrived back in Mali, as this is when the Beast Titan willingly surrendered himself in Stoess to demonstrate he doesn't mean the island any harm. Zeke knew that a stunt like this would send shockwaves across Paradis, but more importantly, it would also allow him to speak to the right people. Just as planned, within 10 hours or so, Historia, Eren, and other VIPs would all arrive in the district for an emergency trial as they'd interrogate him to find out his true motivations. As the trial goes on, he'd give a speech similar to the one he gave Kiyomi in the manga, in which he explains to everyone that he's actually been an Eldian restorationist this whole time. In his words, everything he's done and said up until now was to gain the trust of the Malian military, but behind their backs, he's been making moves to save the Eldian people. Zeke would then claim that the reason he surrendered himself is because the warriors plan to imminently wipe out the island and only he knows the secret to stop it. Zachary would respond by asking Zeke what the secret is, but the beast would turn directly to his younger brother and demand that he can only reveal this knowledge in private to Eren. Following that, the military higher-ups would hold crisis talks on what to do next, as they debate whether Zeke's warning should be taken seriously. In one sense, it is accurate that they were expecting this to happen in the near future, and it's not surprising that a large nation like Mali would have the resources to attack so soon. That being said, there's a possibility that Zeke might be lying so that they give in to his request, which would potentially put the founding titan at risk. At some point during the conversation, Armin would propose that maybe Zeke is telling the truth, since if the beast titan's goal was really to kill or capture Eren, then he could have simply stayed undercover on the island and attacked when they weren't expecting it. The fact he willingly turned himself in indicates that there's something else going on, since being locked underground isn't a great move if he wanted to steal the coordinate. While most people wouldn't buy into Armin's line of thinking, I think Commander Hanju would be the one person to take it seriously, and later that night they'd pay a visit to Zeke in his cell. There the commander would try to find out what exactly this grand plan is that can apparently save the island, but the Beast Titan wouldn't say a thing since he knows Mali are arriving the next day. His prediction is that once he doesn't show up at the harbour, the military will assume that something might have happened to either him or Annie, meaning it's guaranteed the warriors will head to Stoess. When that happens, Parody simply won't have the firepower to fight back, putting them in a desperate situation where they'll have to give in to Zeke's demands. Flashing forward to the present day, Eren, Armin, and Mikasa would sit down for a chat where they'd be discussing the prospect of fighting the warriors a second time. Among the scouts, morale would be pretty low at this point seeing as there are hardly any of them left, and Armin would start to have serious survivor's guilt as he believed that they'd need Eren's leadership in a crisis like this. However, Eren tries to cheer him up by confessing that he knows a way to win even without the commander, 
and it all comes down to the founding titan. For the first time ever, Eren would reveal his theory that he can activate the coordinate by touching a titan of royal blood, but of course he never told anyone about this since he didn't want Historia to be in danger. The reason he tells his friends now is because he thinks it could be the secret plan that Zeke was referring to, meaning that the Beast Titan really might be on their side. Mikasa would likely argue that they should tell someone about this, but Eren would likely be hesitant since if the secret gets out, then there's no telling what exactly the government will do to Historia. Before they decide what they should do next, a large earthquake would rock Stoas district, with injured civilians screaming and running for their lives. Meanwhile, across the rest of the island, Malian forces would descend upon nearly every major city, including Trost District, Orbu District, and even the Royal Capital. It's important for us to remember that Mali's international reputation was damaged by them losing in Chiganshina, and so the general's plan is to remind the world how powerful they are by crushing Paradis in a single day. With over a million soldiers in total, they have way more than enough to target the major locations on the island, while in Stoes, the Colossal Titan demonstrates his destructive power. Bertolt aggressively stomps through the district as a horrified Eren watches on, and considering what happened in Shiganshina a month ago, he'd be uncertain what he can even do in this situation. At the same time, Peek and Porco would be using this distraction from Bertolt to infiltrate military police HQ, where they come face to face with their fellow warrior for the first time in 5 years. Sadly for them, they wouldn't be able to find any sign of Zeke, but the Beast Titan would be safely in his underground cell feeling pretty good about himself, since it's only a matter of time until he finally gets that heart to heart with Eren. Anyhow, before we wrap up today's video, I did want to take a moment to thank today's sponsor, Squarespace. If you're looking for a fast, easy, and affordable way to create a professional looking website, which is something I've been looking to do since starting my channel, then Squarespace is definitely right for you. With so many different platforms and softwares for things like audience insights and blogging tools, I know I personally get overwhelmed with where to even start, but with Squarespace you can do all of these things in one easy to use platform. If you head over to squarespace.com, you can have access to a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, you can go to squarespace.com slash turtlequirk to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. With that said, thanks for watching, and thanks again to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video.